Has everyone heard of the HSSIB report? Yeah? Hands up those who've heard of it. Hmm. So probably about 20%. For the rest of you, that is your homework to go and look up what it is. It talks about an incident and the responding um, information from an um, NHS estate report that they did. It says there's a lack of training and competency in staff working within decontamination. And with that, we need to reduce the risk and increase career pathways. We need to keep people in the organisation. The incident reporting structure tends to be poor in most hospitals, and there should be consistency and transparency with national trends. Who's top management? And we'll talk about that later. How to ensure the reporting structure provides assurance to top management. The way forward to raise the organisation awareness of our roles. Service for decontamination of invasive medical devices is usually done either on-site or off-site. It's provided by NHS staff or a third party private provider. So when you're talking about reprocessing reusable medical devices, you're talking about surgical instruments, but you're also talking about flexible endoscopes and probes, incubators. Yeah. So it's everything within the hospital that is used. A, a device, medical device within a hospital is anything that is used within that hospital for a patient. When you're talking about invasive medical devices, it's something that goes into a patient or used actively on a patient. SSDs process millions of instruments every year. You know, there's increased pressure to get the sets through quickly. How quickly can we get the sets through? We are monitoring, you know, we do, you know, 120,000 sets a year. It's increased from 100,000, that extra 20. Have we got any new staff? No, we're just asking our staff to work a bit faster. Failures can lead to hospital closures. When I was a manager, I could close my hospital. If the SSD unit went down, nothing could work. In fact, one time when our IRO plant went down because something broke on it and we didn't have a replacement, we closed two routine operations for 12 hours. And after the 12 hours, we were threatening to close to trauma because we couldn't clean the instruments. They were going 40 miles down the road and rather than a four hour turnaround, we were looking at a 12 hour turnaround for trauma sets. So it was the one time that I was invited up to the chief exec's office to have a chat and see what we could do about it. Amazing how funds became available quickly. So it can lead to hospital closures. And it can compromise patient safety. If you haven't got clean kit, you can't operate on people. When you're looking at what decontamination does, you're trying to clean everything off an instrument. So Anything that's left on the instrument can infect another patient, whether it's protein, viruses, bacteria. We don't particularly want to share our bodily fluids with other people. You know, it's not something that we choose to do. How many patients come in contact with a blood-borne virus from a contaminated instrument? Do we know how many? I would say, no, we don't. We don't know how many. Who works in an SSD here? Can you put your hands up? Yeah. How many of you have supplied a dirty instrument to theatre in the last year? Yeah, about the same number. So I would say if you're doing anything from 30,000 to 200,000 sets a year, accidentally something will get through that will be dirty. No matter how careful you are, we are only human and we're pushed for time. 
So, we could supply something that wasn't clean. We don't know. How do we know we've, supply, we've supplied something dirty and the infection has been caused by what we've done? Well, we don't know. What's the time from the procedure to the infection developing? Is the patient going to be still in hospital? If you think about an endoscopy procedure, right? So you have a colonoscopy. You've taken all that lovely medicine to clear your bowels out. You've cleared your bowels out. You go in, you have the procedure. You come out. 48 hours later, you get a bit of a tummy upset. Yeah? Got a bit of diarrhea. What do you put it down to? Oh, I put it down to all the drugs that I took and the procedure irritating the bowel. You don't put it down to the ineffective cleaning of that scope that you've got somebody else's bug. You would probably don't even go to the doctor. You just put up with the symptoms, get over it, carry on with life. Do you, if you do go to a doctor, it will be your GP. You won't go back to the hospital because it's 48 hours, it's irrelevant. You know, that's gone, that's in your past. Don't think about that as an infection. There are many other actions in the patient pathway that can lead to infections. Wound management, environmental exposure, you know. The HI, HSIB were told by healthcare staff that the current system that they work work within is not mature or integrated enough to identify whether the source of that blood-borne infection was a contaminated instrument or not. We don't know. So if there is an infection, do people that work within endoscopy, SSD, get involved in the SSI? So it's assumed that the instruments are fine. It's not looking at it. Could there be a link with a specific instrument? What does a technician do? A technician would check thousands of different instruments, ranging from ophthalmics, gynae, orthopedics. We are a jack of all trades. We know how to take retractors apart, we know how to put them together, we know how to do robotic instruments, we know how to put them together, we know how to put them on the tray for cleaning. We identify the different instruments from a checklist, we assemble them in the IAP room, we know the cleaning process, whether it's got to be pre-cleaned, manually cleaned, AD, whether there's a washer, ultrasonic, what are the barriers there? You know, what, what happens? Do you have total quiet while you're doing this and you're concentrating on taking every little bit apart? Or are you in a rushed area with sets coming in and them going, oh, that's a priority. Can you put that in the next washer? Can you just take that apart? Can you break that down? They, while you're doing that, somebody's asking you if there's enough detergent in for the day. When you're in the IAP room, it tends to be quieter. But there's a rush. You've got a stack of sets, usually ophthalmic, orthopedic, gynae, general. You're taking the priorities. The work builds up during the week. At the end of the week, weekend, maybe you have the time to concentrate and get rid of the work that's left. Everybody's under pressure. Everybody's working under pressure. Steriliser. You know... Does it go through 134, 121, low temperature, hydrogen peroxide, Vipro? Which one does it go through? Do you know? Do, you, do the technicians know why it goes through that? Do you know why it goes through that? Send it to the correct location. That sounds dead easy, doesn't it? Really easy. You've got 34 theatres. You've got different trolleys that go. You're loading it, talking. Somebody's asking you questions, you get, pick up a tray, put it on, send it off. And it, did, did I send that to theatre 28 or did I send it to 18? Concentration again. 
daily tests and checks on equipment. When you're really busy, you have to still fit them in. You have to do them. It's a requirement. You want to make sure your equipment's working correctly. Who does it? Is it just a tick box exercise? You know, oh yeah, I know that washer's working because I've just seen it going through, tick, tick, tick. Or do they actually look at it and work it out? What additional roles are we asking the technician to do? We're asking them to do quality checks, to understand what a fail is and why a fail is important. We're asking them to do the daily checks and inform somebody if there's something out of the range. So if they look and they go, oh, it should be dosing at 54 mils per litre and it's dosing at 50, does that matter? Do they know where to look for that information on the printout? Can they read the printout? Or does the machine just go green and they accept it? So your rotating staff, you've got an X amount of staff. You always have sickness, so you might be short of staff. You're moving them from a wash area to IAP to sterilization, moving them back again. You might move them multiple times a day with staff shortages. They are working on their own. They are controlling their own throughput. If you're saying, we've got this amount of sets, we want to increase the throughput, what suffers? Can people carry on at that pace and increase the pace, or does quality suffer? And what does quality mean to the patient? The contact with the customer. You know, how many of us have had phone calls from theatre you know, I want that set. I phoned up 10 minutes ago. Where's that set? Well, it's still in the washer. Well, what, can you fit, fail the washer and get it to me because I need it urgently? You know, I had a consultant one time come round to me and say, bring a dirty set round and say, I want this in an hour. And I was, okay, do you want it washed or do you want it sterilised? And he looked at me and he said, don't be facetious. And I was, nope, the washer takes an hour, the steriliser takes an hour. If you want it in an hour, you've got to miss one out. And he said, realistically, how long is it going to take? And I was four hours. And he was, okay, that's fine. Are we strong enough? Do we have those conversations? How do we train new staff? Oh, these are the fire exits. This is where you get changed. This is your uniform. And go into the IAP room, and Joe, you're going to monitor them. First day, how many, how many new staff have packed a set the first day? Or the first week? I bet the majority of staff have packed a set by the first week. They've wrapped sets. They've stuck labels on. How quickly do they go to empty a washer? Pretty quickly. What's the training period for a new member of staff? A month? Three months? Six months? A year? We've, remember, we've got thousands of instruments they need to know. In three months, are they going to be able to identify all those instruments? Probably not. How long does it take you to learn all those instruments and know how they come apart and being able to identify problems with them? Probably two years. So are we saying the training period could be up to two years for a technician? A band two? Paid the same as the person that is cleaning the corridor? Another important job. But what is the skill set? Basic audits. We audit. Do we get our technicians to audit? Probably not. We get the supervisors to go around and do audits. Technicians doing audits will always find a problem, especially if you say, can you find something wrong? They will. It's good. Raising non-conformances. Are your technicians willing to raise a non-conformance with their team leaders, with their managers? Are they willing to say, I think I've got a problem here. Can I explain it to you? Or are we too busy? Are we too busy trying to get those sets from A to B and through the workforce? Additional roles. Quality system. You know, we've got, we've got a quality system we run. 13485. Most of us have that within our quality system. Taken from the standard. Follow it. Do we actually embed that into our working practices? Do our staff know where the quality system is? 
have they got access to it? Can they go and say, oh, can I just have a look at that? I'm not sure about tracking. Can I see what the quality system says about tracking and the standard? SOPs. Do the staff know how the SOPs relate to the quality system? You know, we have the standard, the quality system, the SOPs come out of that. Do the staff understand? Or is just an SOP stuck to the wall that they look at and they see every day because you become poster blind and you never actually read it? What are the demands of the customer? Increased activity, short notice, and extra lists. Oh, we'll just slip on an extra patient, especially within endoscopy. We've got a list running, we've got an inpatient, we'll just put them at the end of the list. Monitoring and testing and maintenance. You know, oh, you've got to have that machine out of action for three days because it's having an annual done on it. And everybody's, it's really going to put us under pressure. And everybody within the department feels that pressure. Reviewing and signing off the reports. And John will talk about this later. And it's, you know, the importance of it. And having time to look through those reports. When you look through a report, do you go through it in detail and look and check everything? Or do you, your AP says, yes, it's fine, and you just sign it? Acting on non-conformances. You know, how can you make that a learning experience when you have a non-conformance? How can you help that person that made that mistake understand what went wrong and improve the standard for the patient? Staff recruitment. We all struggle with staff recruitment. We're an invisible service, aren't we? We're the engine of that car that's below the bonnet and nobody sees. Without us, as I said, we can close the hospital. Do we need microbiologists and engineers? Yes. They're an integral part of our service. We need them for advice. We need them to inform. We need them because we have to ensure that patients are safe. So training for our staff, what, what training is available? Well, you know, everybody has their own competencies, don't they, within their department. My staff are competent. I can say my staff are competent. Yeah, they have a two-week training period. They're competent. Oh, yours have a three-month training period. Are they more competent than my staff? Is there a level there? Oh, you've got a, you've got a six month competency. So which is, which is right? There's various courses and qualifications. There's no agreed, or there was no agreed and recognized training program. So everybody could choose what they wanted to do. When you make up a training program yourself, there's no standard. It's not leveled and leveled qualifications are really important. There's little recognition by the NHS or other organisations, because third parties are bound still by the NHS, of the importance of our role. You know, what do you do? You clean instruments. Oh, yeah. So you put them into something like a dishwasher. Yeah, well, everybody's got dishwashers at home. So everybody knows you put it in and that's fine. And then it's sterilised. There's little respect for what you do. You know, if you have theatres come to you and you have a new theatre member, when I had new theatre staff, you know, if I had orthopaedic staff, I'd make them do ophthalmic sets. The first thing they would say is, I don't work in ophthalmics. And I go, you do now. You do everything. After ophthalmics, you can have gynae. And they start to realise that our staff are expected to know everything. Why are we not better recognised for it then? We're managing more devices. You know, decontamination managers are quite often over endoscopy. We manage endoscopes, TOE, other probes, ultrasound probes. And where are ultrasound probes found? Well, theatres, ultrasound, early pregnancy, ICU, ED. Physiotherapy. So when you start thinking decontamination covers 
much more than just invasive medical devices. These are invasive instruments, or can be. So from the HISB report, let's just get all these up. And if I go too far, I apologize. I think that's it, yes. So we're looking at the staff's ability to decontaminate a large number of different equipment types in vast numbers to a set quality and standard. Yeah, agree with that? We are reprocessing a lot of instruments to a very tight time frame. And we are totally reliant on that technician to get it right and follow the manufacturer's instructions. So do they have access to the manufacturer's instructions or are they in the manager's office on the wall? Have they been trained on them? We've got thousands of instruments. Are they just trained on the complicated instruments? You know, uh, when you have a um, Makindo forcep, are they able to identify it as a Makindo forcep? Needle holders, are they aware of the tungsten inserts on them? Do they know what to look for? We're expecting a lot from our staff. We're looking at their professionalism. Their, no one will come to work and want to make a mistake. They are doing it for patient safety. They are doing it to feel good for themselves that they have done a good job. But if we don't train them, how can they have a skill? How can they be competent? The investigation concluded that current staff were the strongest barrier to preventing to prevention of an incorrectly decontaminated equipment being sent to an operating theatre. So it's our staff that are protecting patients. So why are errors being made? So a report done in 2016, looking at over two and a half period, 48 hospitals. So 32,000 instruments were checked. 31% needed replacement. 33% needed repair. 18% had issues with finishes, such as corrosion and watermarks. 18% were acceptable. How do we expect our staff to say that instruments are fit for use if we've got these figures? You know, 70 odd percent are in some way damaged. Will that, will that affect the way they are washed and sterilized? No wonder. So, when you're thinking of instruments, you know, the average hospital, 735 beds, 18 theaters, lots of operations per year, how many instruments on a set? An average of 48. Just multiply that up. We talk about how many sets are processed each year. What's the actual instrumentation that each technician will, will process in that year? What's the value of that instrument? You know, they're talking about millions of pounds worth of instruments that they're, they're processing, they're handling every year. And that doesn't include endoscopy. It doesn't include ultrasound probes. This is just basic instruments. And probably this doesn't include robotic, like Da Vinci and Mako and that sort of thing at Cambridge. Do we have a budget for maintenance, refurbishment, and replacement? And who holds it? Theatres hold it? Quite possibly. Um, if instruments are in good condition, the risk to the patient is lower. They're easier to clean. You're not going to have crevices and cracks and that sort of thing where contamination can get into. So as soon as you start getting damaged instruments, the risk of an infection is higher. And remember, we talked about if there's an infection, where will the patient present? To the GP. A long time after the operation. Could getting the instrumentation up to standard 
be a way of reducing contamination risks? The technical bulletin. It talks about current legislation, standards and guidance, acts and regulations, code of practice, British standards, best practice guidance. It talks about current training and competency and talks for the first time about professional membership. It talks about organisational structure, job descriptions and job profiles. And the reporting structure up. The requirements for decontamination staff. Training. Competency matrix. Career pathways. Skills. How to develop. How do you develop your technicians? How do you develop your team leaders? How do you develop your managers? And continued professional development. So when you're talking about registration, it's directories or registers that are held by the healthcare science register, the school. So if you do the IDSC technical certificate, you're on a directory. Your name is on that directory and anyone can look and see that you have passed that qualification and you're on the directory. If you're an IDC chartered member, you have a directory. You have qualifications to get chartered membership. Your name is on that directory. And the School of Healthcare Science has non-accredited registers. So like nurses have to have registration, we are moving towards that. Directories are the first step at that. We need to professionalize. We need to train and qualify our staff. So when you're looking at an apprentice trainee, and this is coming out in the bulletin, which will be an addendum to the HTM, HTM 0101 Part A. So those working in decontamination will, will be aware of this. So what are we looking at? We're looking that they need the basic skills. We're looking at workload and work within their own competency. So they're not asked to do a set that they've never seen before. And I would say the majority of technicians are asked to do sets they haven't seen before because they know the basic instruments and they're, once they're competent, well, you can do everything. Relationship management. It's looking at communication skills, having respect for each other, not only within the department, but within the hospital. So that people can go to somebody, an expert in decontamination, and ask a question. They're not frightened to do that, and they know how to pass that information on. Interpersonal behaviours. You know, when you're working in a small team, in a confined environment, and you're put under pressure, people get snappy. You know, when theatres phone up for the fifth time about that set that is still in the washer because that washer takes an hour, instead of, oh, yes, I'm, I'm sorry, it's in the washer and it's got another five minutes to go, you'll say, this is the fifth time you phoned up. Immediately puts people's backs up. So what qualification could this operator do? They could do an apprenticeship. Sorry, Wales, wherever you are, Wales at the back. It's not available in Wales, Scotland, or Northern Ireland, but it is available in England. It's a course that is taken from the levy that all hospitals pay. So it's a free, basically, for staff. And it's a level two qualification. And when you've completed that, you go on to a register for healthcare scientists at a level two. So once you've got that qualification, if you notice, you're on the register, registered with healthcare scientists. And that's what re is recommended, that when you're competent, you are on a register. And you can move from hospital to hospital. You are qualified. You go as and as competent. So when you're a competent technician, what should you be able to do? You're competent in skills to undertake effective, compliant decontamination. You're able to work on your own. You're able to help new staff. You're able to advise them and help them. You're working within your own capability. You know what your limits are. You know when to ask for help. 
and you're working in compliance with the quality management system. You're able to have good communication. You will be able to take, tell theatres why something is being delayed. And you'll be working towards your IDSC technical certificate, which is a level three. So your level two is equivalent to a GCSE, A to C. Your level three is equivalent to an A level. So just going quickly through, because I'm aware we're running out of time. Um, training and qualifications. Your organization and department does the initial induction. And that will be the training program and competency assessments. The recognized qualifications are the apprenticeship, a level two, which is an assistant level. You've got the level three within England, um, which is the IDSC technical certificate. And this is um, awarded by SQA, which is the Scottish awarding body. So it's a level six in Scotland and a level four in the EU. So equivalent to A levels. It is recognized anywhere in the world because it is a leveled qualification. And then you've got the level three diploma, which is an apprenticeship, uh, sorry, level four um, apprenticeship, which is above A level standards, so almost foundation degree. And this is in England. Um, and within Northern Ireland, you've got a diploma level three. So there are qualifications out there and we should be using them. So when you're looking at it, the healthcare science, the level two, there have been 83 people that have completed the endpoint assessment for that. The associate level four, there's been two. For the technical certificate, you'll notice we're averaging sort of 50 odd, just over 50 every year, two exams. So a reasonable number going through and there's a, a, um, currently 100 on the course. And the old course, which was not accredited, finished last November. With the apprenticeship scheme, there's two external providers, so you don't have to do it in-house if you don't want to. You can do with your education department and the local higher education college, but you can ask a separate company to do it. Um, and they do the healthcare level two and the level four, and it's competency-based. So the assistant, you have to describe, explain, outline, perform, um, and complete 40 credits. For the associate, you have to have 100 credits, and you're asked to compare and analyze and explain. So the level four, you're looking at junior manager level. Level two, you're looking at technicians. Level three, you're looking at um, supervisors. So these are the mandatory units for the level two. So you've got the sort of investing, um, treating, managing human disease and disorder. You've got workplace safety, so health and safety and that sort of thing. And you can see the credit levels and the number of learning hours. These are the specific ones for decontamination. And you'll notice that um, 13, an introduction to decon, and when I was doing it in my trust, we, we actually taught all the healthcare scientists within the trust, I taught the introduction to decontamination. Because even if you're working in pathology, you still need to know about decontamination. Then 96, 97, 98 are specific to SSDs. 99 and 100 are for endoscopy. So the technical certificate, you've got eight modules. Um, fairly straightforward. It's a theory-based course rather than a practical course. The technical certificate, you're looking at supervisors and team leaders. It's examination-based, so you submit the questions at the end of each assignment before you do it. And it used to be called the workbook, and that is a pass or fail. And that is to see if the examiners look at that and see if that person they think is capable of, of doing the exam. Two parts, multiple choice questions, paper one, which is an hour, and a written question, um, short, longer answers, so 16 to 20 questions, which is a two-hour exam. And the cost is £1,000 per candidate. So how much does an A-level e cost? Eight, nine thousand can do. So £1,000 is really cheap. 
This is what the candidate has. They have to write their candidate number, so no names. It's all on candidate number. And there's a slash um, with the year. So you might have one, two, three, four, slash 24, which means you registered in 24 and you have two years in which to complete the course. The BTEC Level 4 Senior Supervisor Production Manager, it goes into more detail. It's asking why you do things. If you jump from a level two to a level four, you miss out on that knowledge. You have to have that basic knowledge. It's not taught in the level four. It's expected that you know Dalton's Law, that you know the classification of instruments. These are the core units that are in the level four. So again, you've got more core units. And these are the specific ones for decontamination. Um, we've put the credits at the end. Come on. Oop. There we are. So it tells you, you have to, for an apprenticeship, you have to have 20% off job training. For the technical certificate, there's no requirement to have off job training. For the apprenticeship, there's funding. The assistant, so that's level two, 12 to 18 months, 12 to 15 months. For the associate, it's 18 to 24 months. So it's quite a commitment. And endpoint assessments, so they're done on site and somebody will come and do observations. This gives you an idea of how many have been done. And if you look, being the chair of the Southwest branch, I'm rather proud that actually we've had the most apprenticeships in the area. And we're trying to encourage that. So I know Sharon's with her branch. And she'll be pushing to try to get to overtake us. But we've done really well in the Southwest at getting buy-in from trusts. But you can see there's not a huge number have been done. And when you look at the technical certificate, the numbers are fairly static. They're good. They're coming on. They're coming through. So the... Oh, the safety observation is it must be beneficial to find clear lines of accountability for sterile service departments to include services provided by NHS trust and contracted services. So even if you provide a service to a trust, you are expected to follow guidance. So how is our role viewed by senior personnel? You know, do they know who you are? Possibly not. Are we good at getting the job done? We are very good at getting the job done. We are under the radar. We get it done. Theatres carry on. They don't know that we're there. You know, magically sets appear on their set, on their trays, ready for them to be used. We're not a distinct professional group of staff because we don't talk to each other. We're not called the same. When we talk to Unison, I've been talking to Unison, to find out if we can push for our members to get this registration, do qualifications. And they said, well, what are your staff called? Well, I went, came back with 15 names, and they went, we can't, can't find any members. And I was giving them reps names, and they, they work in the department. Oh, well, they're called that, they're called that. We can't find ourselves, we're lost. The complexity of what we do is not understood. We don't promote ourselves. We're not, we're not recognized as healthcare science staff, even though the qualifications we do are healthcare science. How many of you have got healthcare science in your job description? That is the first thing. All technicians should be healthcare scientists. Check when you go back to check that on your pay slip that you are a healthcare scientist. We don't really have direct reporting. We should do, but we don't. We don't have a clinical lead for decontamination. And we don't have clinical input until it goes wrong, and then we're blamed. This, I'll, I'm talking about this later, so I'll skip over that. We talk about a decontamination safety group. We all have decon meetings, yes? Should, these are the sort of people that should be attending. It comes out in the bulletin. You will be able to see it. How do we promote ourselves? Open days. Does anyone have an open day at their hospital? Yeah. We had an open day. We went down. We had a stall. 
theatre staff were fascinated. Our store was constantly full of theatre staff and their families seeing what we did. They didn't know how instruments went together. They were fascinated to see our staff doing it. We work with other departments, lots of other departments. We should invite surgeons to our department. Have a look when they get new equipment. Come and have a play in our department rather than in theatres. We should cross-train. We should have theatre staff up working with us, seeing what we do. Since COVID and before COVID, with the pressure on theatres, that cross-working has stopped. The Institute has established links with these people. We're at present talking with NHS employers um, about job descriptions becoming registered so that you can look and you can go on to the NHS website and pick off a job description. We need to raise our profile. We need to be proud of what we do. Thank you for listening.